My name is Ken Wells. This is Dan Quigley. We uh, are uh, part of the service and support team at Flex Radio, but this is not a Flex Radio presentation. We're sponsoring it. But uh, Mike Walker, who's the presenter officially today, is a very experienced remote operator. And so he's going to be talking about remote operations using a lot of different techniques and a lot of different equipment. So we hope it'll be educational for you. Mike is, how long has Mike been doing that? He's been remoting radios since before Flex Radio, I think, and had been remoting even his Flex stuff before um, Smart Lake was introduced. Yeah, before the Hudson Bay Company came out, yeah. So uh, Mike was planning on being here for this. He worked really hard on the presentation, but uh, some uh, personal things came up and he wasn't able to make the trip. And so uh, we, uh, being in the technical support department, are used to speaking workarounds. So this is our workaround remoted remote remote workshop. So uh, without any other further um, smart alec comments, I'm going to hit the play button. After that, we'll take a minute to reconfigure the audio and we're going to call Mike on the cell phone and relay questions to him and he will be able to answer questions. And how long do we have? Okay. Okay. There's nothing more fun than doing a remote operation from your radio and uh, being able to check in from your office or whatever. But here we go. If I can find the, the play button on this. And uh, you guys in the back, give me a thumbs up, thumbs down. If it's not loud enough, you want to give me that. And here we go. Hi, everybody. It's Mike the Ice Graham W. And normally I'd be standing up here on the stage with you, but due to a few circumstances beyond my control, I wasn't able to make it to Dayton this year. So we're going to do the next best thing, and we're going to do a talk on remote. I'm just going to happen to be remote. So the goal of my presentation today is to give you some ideas to get started and help you build out your own station, some significant things you need to think about, and uh, where to get some other ideas. Every remote, H station, every remote HF station is different. Uh, they're like a thumbprint. Uh, what's important to me may not be important to you. But what I hope to do is to give you some ideas uh, on how to solve some key things, how to build a good foundation, uh, a few other cool parts, and uh, then some areas where you can go to get some additional information. So without any further ado, we will move forward on our presentation. So what is remote HF operating? Well, for the last hundred or so years, or back all the way to Marconi, uh, ham shacks were the nerve center of radio operating. You had a place in your basement, you brought in a whole pile of cables from antennas from everywhere, and as antennas got further away, we used more and more expensive cables, and all feed lines and everything led to the ham shack. The power led to the ham shack. Uh, it was a dedicated operating location buried in some part of the house. Some of us were in basements, some of us were in garages, some of us were in HF or um, in sheds in the backyard, uh, depending on your atmosphere. And I know when I first started, my first ham shack was in a crawl space. And I'm still amazed to this day that I was able to drag around a model uh, 28 teletype in a crawl space and get it on a table. However, today, the ability to remote is incredibly mainstream. We have many different radio vendors building radios that are internet aware or ethernet aware and allows us to connect to them remotely. We're seeing that ethernet is replacing RS-232 as the way to communicate with different hardware. Antenna switches, amplifiers, radios. Users use Ethernet to connect to radios now, uh, and which is wonderful because it allows us to grow. Things get so much better, and we're not limited to the part of RS-232, which is an incredible point-to-point -point type of communication tool. Not really scalable is what we call it in the IT world. And you can make a simple installation with a radio in a multi-band antenna and be incredibly successful just by setting it up and being able to operate remote. So why do you want to do a remote station? Well, maybe we've got noise and you just can't hear any signals. And I know when I first moved from one part of Toronto to another back in 2005, that was a big case. We were in a new house for a week. 
took a hunk of wire, tossed it over a tree in the backyard, looked at my FD897, and I went, wow, 40 meters must be dead. And it was then, even that far back, that I was incredibly exposed to the urban noise that most of you are, are dealing with. Um, so I, I got, I wasn't operating that much. I was operating at friends' places. I'd go to contests, and, and it was cool. I got my picks. But that was about uh, 2005, and then we had a cottage or a camp or whatever, second property. And I operated from up there on the weekends when I could, but it was closed in the winter, and that's where all the contesting was. You might be in a location where you just can't put up a good antenna. It might be a small house, a small yard. Uh, you've got, uh, you know, laws that say you can't do this or that. So this may drive you down another, another way. Uh, you may be downsizing. Maybe you're moving from an apartment built or from a house into an apartment building or uh, maybe assisted living. Uh, and uh, so that takes you off the air. You know, and, and for a lot of us, ham radio has been a part of our life since we're kids. It's been our social engineering tool. Uh, and uh, we communicated with our friends, with the rest of the world. We met new people. Maybe you live in an HOA and you're trying to do stuff in an attic. And we have, a, we did, I did a survey a few months ago, at least in uh, the U.S. And uh, what's the story? One in four people live in an HOA. Oh, it's a bigger number than I thought. Not common in Canada, pretty common in the United States. Maybe your buddies are shut in. Uh, they've had to move to something uh, smaller or assisted living, still wants to get on the air. Uh, maybe you can lend them your station by using the tools available by remote connection to your HF station. Or your friend just can't build a station. Uh, or another thing that I haven't gotten a slide, it's a great Elmering tool. Maybe you can get new young blood, some kids. Those are the ones under 40 <laughs> involved in ham radio. Uh, we're all getting older, but we still need new people in the hobby. And uh, as I said before, maybe, you know, my new QTH is an apartment. Well. Uh, you can do uh, mag loops and stuff and get on the air, but maybe you want some more. And uh, maybe you're just bored and want to really exploit things and your hobby needs a hobby. And uh, that's the beauty of ham radio, is there's just no end to it. It goes on like the universe. There's just so much parts of ham radio. So those are some of the things that I think of when I think of remote. While you're sitting here, you may come up with some other ideas that are remote to you. Just keep them in mind, and we'll talk about them at the end of the presentation. So what types of remote are there? Well, we can have, I just want to operate, well, I want to get in a ham shack because it's in a crawl space or the backyard or the basement or a shed or um, anywhere, and maybe I just want to operate from the backyard or, or somewhere a little nicer. Uh, I was a camp counselor forever ago, and this is an interesting story. And I, uh, it was a long time ago in the mid 70s, and they let me bring my DX40 and my HR10B to this place on a remote island in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and it was a big camp, it was a, a boys' camp. But they let me, uh, they put all this stuff up, and, and I, I remember asking for, well, where can I operate from? And they, we walk around, they were incredibly accommodating. And uh, we found um, an outhouse wasn't used anymore, it was all closed down, it was didn't smell, but it was that structure. And they gave me this building with a lock on it and some power, and I operated all summer from that, and I got new kids involved in HM, HF radio back in the so it was 76 or 77, I'd only been a ham for a few years and uh, in Canada, and all I had was the, um, our basic was 10 words a minute, and that's all I could operate with CW. But you know what, it was cool, I was on the air. Uh, but getting back to, you know, first part of HF remote operating, maybe just get out of the ham shack. Um, maybe your antenna system is getting further and further away from the house because you want to get away from the noise. It's a lot easier to run Cat5 cable or Ethernet cable from the base of your house over to a shed maybe at the base of your tower. If you can get power out to there and uh, keep it a little warm and a little cool, why not put all your radios back there? And it, uh, it's a lot cheaper than running cables. Believe it or not, um, RF cables go bad. And I've mentioned them. I've had what I thought were pretty good RF cables. They'd been in place for 10 and 15 years. I'd pull them down, and now that we have the tools with mini VNAs or uh, tracking generators to measure the loss through the cable, 
uh, I had an 80 meter dipole cable that I was incredibly surprised after I measured it that it had, where it should have half a dB of attenuation at 80 meters, actually had 7 dB of attenuation at 80 meters. It was amazing when nobody could hear me. And it was only a 130 foot run, which shouldn't be an issue. So I picked up some LMR 240, which was uh, lighter than the RG213 that it was, uh, or RG8, I guess, and replaced it. And uh, unbelievable performance improvement. Uh, maybe I want to operate, build an HF station. Uh, maybe I've got a second building or a property or something within, or a friend's property within a couple of miles. We're a 20-minute drive. Well, that's easy to build out and easy to test and easy to do things for, especially if you have a problem. Because with every HF station, and you're going to hear me say this a lot, Murphy's an optimist. He's going to come and bite you in the butt. So things may or may not work. And you may have to go make a road trip to fix it or reboot something. And when you build a, and the further away you get, the more things you have to add. Uh, like, consider everything that um, you turn on and off or have to reboot. Well, it might take uh, you know a road trip to go fix it. So you become very good at using web switches to turn things on and off. But this can scale. This can you can build this out as you get started. You can't do this all at once. Uh, if you do, it'll be a recipe for disaster. So uh, that's one of the key things about making a reliable HF station. Uh, and maybe because it's uh, in a remote, uh, a quieter location. As I said before, you may want to share this with friends. And uh, you, uh, we've got, um, you know, on the flex side, it's not uncommon for us to call. they got a bunch of guys, three or four guys. They want to build a little uh, consortium, for lack of a better term. They've got a hunk of property and some internet, and uh, that allows them to build a station that uh, they can get up and going for a bunch of them to share that's quieter. And remember, you can't hear them. You can't work them. And we're all getting older, so what this means is we can't always build the antenna system we want. And we're going to want to maybe have a collaborative station, a small, let's say a small club, maybe a big club. That's where HF Remote becomes incredibly popular too. And then the next phase, you're into the last phase like me, I'm remote and it isn't close. I'm fortunate because it's an hour and a half drive to my station. Uh, our cottage is closed all winter. Nothing's heated. I run everything in an unheated box. Uh, no special climate control. I've never had an issue. And uh, it gets about as warm as 30 Celsius in the summertime. I just have multiple fan systems for the summer. And for the cold, I, um, I leave everything on. I find I get enough heat from uh, PCs and power supplies. I use linear power supplies because they actually do produce heat. So I want that heat in my box. And uh, but if I get something go wrong, uh, it's a it's an hour and a half trip each way, so a three hours round trip. Fortunately, I don't mind the drive, especially when you work at home a lot. You uh, you're looking for, forward to uh, to getting out of the house. So and for this, I built a real DX station. I can run SO2R if I want, and I can work a whole pile of people uh, with it, and I can hear things. And case in point is right now uh, it's uh, Thursday the uh, 19th. It's at 8:20. Here and I am hearing some really cool six meter opening stuff. A little bit into the Pacific comes and goes on six. Uh, I can hear it because it's quiet at my station. Uh, others that are more urban have not been able to hear that even though they may have better antenna systems. Let's talk about your levels of expertise. I'm gonna sound a bit like a flex radio uh, commercial here, but it's with good reason. Something like the Flex 6400 or even a U6300, a very economical radio, makes a great remote radio. And if you're using a radio with an antenna system uh, that's maybe one or two antennas or a multi-band antenna, it is truly a plug-and-play event. You can drop the radio down, you can hook up your one or two antennas, you can uh, add a web switch, you know, some sort of remote switch to turn the power on and off and, and reboot the radio, and you're pretty much on the air ready to go. That's an incredibly rock solid foundation. Uh, you don't need to solder anything, and believe it or not, for the most part, you probably don't need to do any magical internet work. As you grow your station, you may need to then get a little more technical, and you may need some help, or you may have the skills. But maybe you're going to start adding multiple antennas. Uh, certainly when you start getting more than two antennas, uh, it gets a little more complicated. 
Uh, you may want to add an amplifier or a rotator. And I'll give you some clues about how to get through that uh, hurdle in a couple of slides. And then the last one is, you're all in, you're fully integrated, you know, you probably shouldn't be sitting here. Maybe I should, I'll ask you as a guest speaker to come and join next year and we'll elaborate on what you have done because I do really want to hear more ideas. And keep in mind, at any level, we're all Elmers. In Ham Radio, we've been so good through the decades about helping other people. I, I urge you all that to help or ask questions. Don't go it alone. Leverage all of us. We're all here to help. And that's one of the beauties of Amateur Radio is, you know, uh, we're, we're, it's, it's a great social group. Don't... Uh, don't believe or read everything. Or if, you know, don't believe everything you hear or see on social media, uh, type of things. Uh, we all have our trolls, but we'll we'll work around with them. So here's some key, key bits. You really have to have to have a desire to do this. You really need a radio that supports remotes, and the ones I'm familiar with are Flex Radio, ICOM. Uh, I believe Yesu's got a bit. I've got no experience with the Yesu interface uh, at all. Uh, certainly Elecraft does uh, with their K3 and their K30 and their K4 certainly will have a pretty good uh, solution they're still working on that and you know they're there you just gotta go look for them and you need a site if it's not in your all in your own property and then you need a way to communicate with it first off you'll see on some of my slides I have QR codes uh, if you scan this QR code or click on the link you'll be able to go see a video of my station it's on my QRZ page at VA3 MW, but you know this will take you right to the YouTube video as well. I originally started back in 2005 with with a TS480, which I thought was an amazing radio because all the the CAT commands, the computer aided transceiver commands, were available on the RS232 port, right on the um, right on the radio. So that was a big step. And Ham Radio Deluxe in its client server mode, where you'd run a copy at both ends, being the radio end and the end user end. Uh, allowed you to do a fair bit of work and I used uh, Skype for my audio. Um, it could also do some CW with it. Uh, it wasn't great, uh, it was sort of voxy, but I got on the air, worked some contests, started having some fun, so I was, uh, I was pretty happy with the way that worked out. Uh, I started to expand the station with uh, KMtronic web switches, I'll talk more about those in a minute. Uh, I learned about routers, and not all routers are rated equal. E equal, we'll talk about that. But here's where I really learned that having a PC at the remote end was a must-have, and I'll explain more why uh, doing that. And, and don't let that part scare you, because we've been running PCs and servers remotely and banks and just about everything for decades, and that science is nailed. It's incredibly reliable. Uh, I know there's, I don't want to leave anything at the remote end, but I'll tell you, a, um, a laptop that always starts up remotely running remote desktop tools uh, is an incredible tool for a lot of different reasons, and I'll explain why. Uh, I ultimately expanded the station into running a step or a rotator. Now I have a Power Genius amplifier that replaced the KP8500 or my B26 RF kit amplifier. And I've got some big, tall trees, and I'm able to really leverage wire antennas, so that was pretty cool. This station really started to become a competitive HF station. Now the big problem was trying to keep my butt in the chair because I couldn't sit that long, but uh, uh, but I DX and do everything, and so that worked out uh, worked out really good. So here's, some, as I mentioned, some ra radios that I'm gonna talk about for HF operation remotely. Um, I'm a little biased, but I'm also a ham and I've tried all of them. Flex Radio by far has the easiest radio to integrate right now for remote HF, and it's not just me saying that. Uh, there are others saying that. Uh, it just sort of works, and it was designed that way from the ground up. Uh, Elecraft has a great solution for their K3-0. They don't make it anymore uh, type of thing, but it's available, and um, uh, sideband CW, everything. And digital actually becomes a problem. Uh, hopefully I can touch on that in a bit if you're doing FT8. Uh, the, they will have a uh, remote in the K4. It's in their roadmap. It will definitely happen. Uh, ICOM has their RSBA1 software to com for radios, uh, for a fair number of the radios, 7610, 7300, 705, uh, 7100, maybe even the 7200 uh, type of thing. I know that Yesu has a SCU LAN uh, 10. I'm not familiar with it at all, but I'd love to hear at the end of this presentation in case any of you are. Remote MIG is a great piece of power um, uh, black boxes where you uh, take the interface between 
uh, it likes control heads, and that's what Elecraft used, and that's it works really well with the TS-480, FT-8, uh, 57, or anything with a control head where you actually remote the control head by plugging it into one black box, you take the other black box, you plug it into the radio. They're about um, $500 US a pair for both ends. You do require some network expertise to do that because it, uh, uh, it doesn't do any tunneling and everything, so you have to do that. Uh, so you can get creative with that. Um, MFJ1234, uh, Charlie, the RigPi remote station server. Um, not very familiar with it, but um, it's got a bit of a following. They've had it out for a number of years. Uh, again, near the end, if anybody's using that, we'd love to hear your experience, how complicated it is, and did it work for you, uh, type of thing. Uh, remote hams with their RC4. Um, you can Google that one and, and look that one up. And there's more and more changing all the time. We are hearing of stuff happening all the time because remote is becoming more mainstream and uh, we certainly want to hear more. And then there's the operator room. That's the part that you and I use. Uh, Flex Radio has uh, the Maestro, which is a control head, big control head, and it will actually call home or connect to the radio in so many different ways, whether it's in your house, on your Wi-Fi, or half a world away. Uh, you can use a PC to communicate with the radio and run your digital programs with Smart SDR. Uh, some um, tools with uh, like remote ham radio have a web browser to connect to radios and get on the air. That's a pay for service and whether you like it or not, it's uh, pretty successful. And uh, think of it this way, uh, you've got some money in the bank, you're, you're uh, in a assisted care living thing, you'd be happy to spend some money to get on the air and uh, or, or whatever. So, and that's not really in conflict, I don't think, with amateur radio and the business. And they certainly don't want to go there because you're you're not doing business on the radio. You just uh, you've created a service for hams to get on the air. ICOM has their PC software, uh, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, Marcus, our uh, good friend DLA and MR8, has has written iOS, iOS software for the Mac and um, you know iOS devices for both ICOM and Flex Radio. There are some people coming out with some Android solutions that are creative, some Linux interfaces and connections that are coming out. Uh, although they're really niche, uh, they are there. None of the mainstream vendors are doing it yet. Uh, maybe someday. I know in our world, the Flex Radio world, we'd be happy for somebody to pick up the torch and create it. We'd be happy to help them out. Uh, Flex probably will not do it themselves, but they certainly will make themselves available as a resource to get somebody who wants to work in Android or Linux going. And then the, here we come, the connection, the big part between you and the radio. So think of the radio on your network. The radio is a server. It sits on your network. And it wants to communicate mostly outbound, which is opposite to everything we've done today. So the outbound speed of your, or sorry, the upload, uplink speed from your radio to the outside world is now key. As you're getting into this, you know, I'm not just operating from home, but I'm getting away from home. And so... How much do I need? Well, that depends on the, on the equipment you're using, but I would say minimum one megabit's a good start, five is better, and past that doesn't really matter. Um, and networks, like watching video, people say, well, I've had customers call me and say, you know, my remote stuff is terrible, but my Netflix is great. Well, yeah, there's a big difference. Uh, you don't really care if your movie lags behind 30 seconds or so, but you do care if the QSO you're listening to lags behind by more than half a second or maybe one second. There are good and bad routers. Uh, I would stay away from anything inexpensive. Uh, there's uh, In our forums, we can talk about routers. I have found a very good consumer-based router by IQ Router, by uh, EvenRoute. You can buy it on Amazon. It's not that expensive. And uh, it does a lot of things automatically. You can go look that up. Believe it or not, there are good and bad ISPs. And no matter how much you try, they're just terrible. Uh, they, they may be overloaded. Uh, they're, if they're a WISP, they're a, which means they're a wireless ISP, you may find the performance substandard because they're oversubscribed. And a lot of these people never designed um, their network for the streaming we do today. Wi-Fi is fundamentally broken because we never really designed it for what it can do today. And there's a big difference between speed and latency. 
And, uh, and there are also internet service providers that won't let you run a server at your end. Again, like the radio, or maybe even a webcam for that matter. And um, you're going to have to check with your ISP. Generally, this is uh, ISPs that use a technology called Carrier Grade NAT or CG NAT. Starlink is one of them currently. Uh, usually, if you're using a cellular hotspot, that is a carrier grade NAT, and it's the type of thing where you may not be able to call directly to your radio. There are some solutions to work around that, and um, they're complicated and they're hugely latent. Uh, so you're not going to get your sub millisecond response time. So how much do I need? Well, upload is going to be the key number. We all have lots of download, but upload from the radio, upload to the outside world. Uh, again, it checks, tests, it, it depends on your ISP, and I'm going to show you some tools here. Uh, you're going to hear about something called buffer bloat. If you've got bad buffer bloat, you're not going to like your performance. So you need good buffer bloat numbers and low jitter numbers. And there are good routers that handle this automatically, like the IQ router. So, buffer bloat. What about buffer bloat? Well, you can go read about buffer bloat online, just Google it. But if you scan this QR code, uh, you'll be able to run a buffer bloat test. And the link is below it. And here is a buffer bloat test on my remote, I think I did the other night. It's a grade C. It's a grade C, A, B is better. It's not bad, but you, um, it shows that the, um, um, some measurements in the bottom left that, uh, uh, you know, web browsing is okay, audio calls are okay, but if it gets really loaded, it might fall apart. And because I, my ISP is a big, long cable that runs all the way around the lake and I'm at the far end, sometimes I do experience some breakup and drop. I can't do anything about it. I just have to accept it. And the next thing, part of the foundation, is your jitter. Low jitter numbers are better. This is a jitter tool. And uh, you can see in this, the, the jitter is down to four milliseconds, although at different times it can be a little bit higher. Those numbers aren't bad. Um, start getting 100 milliseconds or higher. That's a big issue. One of the biggest problems that you may have is um, your router and your modem at the far end. How many times have you had to fix something by going to reboot it? Well, you're not there. And in my case, through the winter, I, I use Raspberry Pis for things, but I have my modem reboot every night at 3 in the morning. Just in case something goes wrong, it just recovers on its own. And this all came apart uh, a long time ago when my modem went offline in the middle of the winter, and I phoned my ISP and said, hey, I'm offline. He said, yeah, yeah, Mr. Walker, no problem. We pushed some firmware out. Might have taken you offline. If you could just unplug it and plug it back in, you'd be good to go. Well, you know, that was another hour and a half drive each way. So just the other day, I found this thing called the Easy Outlet 5 on Amazon.com in the U.S. I couldn't find it in Canada. It's $70, and you can configure this to automatically reboot your, your modem and your router, or maybe if the Internet goes away because it pings things in the outside world, then to just automatically reboot. Oh, Internet's down. Let's reboot. I thought that was a good tool. Now... I've talked about having a PC at the far end, and this is one of the key reasons why. There is a product available by him called PST Rotator and PST Rotator AZ, and we're going to talk about the AZ version. This is a great piece of software that allows you to turn relays on and off, to turn your beam, to control your stepper. Uh, you can use it remotely. It's got these little cool web page interfaces, so you can... Turn things off from a phone if you're far away. You may need some network skills, but all of this is very doable. And it's not incredibly expensive. And the author is amazing. And uh, uh, we could do a whole hour just on PST Rotator AZ. Uh, it's got an excellent user group. Uh, they're on both Facebook and uh, there's an email group. Uh, good help and well thought out. And uh, Kudrut, the author, I don't know how many times I've emailed them and said, Hey, Kudrut, I got a great idea for you. And you can write it all up and it gets back to you and says, yeah, that's, that's okay. Um, I'm pretty busy, but, you know, I'll have a look at it. And, like, the next morning is, yeah, I have a new version downloaded. Give it a try. You need to support these people and pay them. They're <laughs> worth every penny. And I think it's 29 euros or something, if that, 19 euros. It's, in the grand scheme of what we invest in our hobby, incredibly little. I use these interfaces to um, turn things on and off. Uh, 
you need to just visualize, as I said, anything you need to power cycle, whether it's a DC power line, whether it's an AC power line type of thing. Uh, the one on the top right, which I understand is out of stock at the moment, and plug right into a Raspberry Pi and turn on power things on and off. I use a lot of those, but I bought it with four of them. Microbit makes an incredibly great remote web switch. Uh, and you can um, you can run to 100, 110 volts, well, you shouldn't, but through them. The relays will support it, but it's probably not supported by your um, in your county or whatever, you're by your government. So you may have to control different types of switches. But if you're creative, I didn't say a word. Uh, the KMtronic switches, as I mentioned, they've got a variety of different ones. The one on the bottom right is incredibly popular, the digital logger I.O. switch. It, it can, you can connect to it from a web page uh, type of thing. Another thing we can probably spend an hour on its own discussing. There's hundreds of Internet of Things web switches from um, uh, on uh, Amazon that make it easy just to turn power supplies on and off type of thing. And, and you can search for those on your own. And there's the links to them. And when you download this, you can go uh, look and, and find a whole bunch of your own solutions. Again, at the end, it's maybe we want to hear about your favorite. Okay, with Lightning, I can only spend a minute on this, but a great document at the bottom. There is no app that will take your feed lines and toss them out the window. I have no good answer for you. Uh, you're going to roll the dice. I have been touch wood, lucky so far. Others have not. Uh, there's some great do-it-yourself solutions that part the feed line uh, by six or eight inches uh, type of thing and other cables. Uh, not perfect. Nothing will survive a direct strike, but that may help with a static discharge. All right. I'm going to spend a few minutes on this, and that's why do we put a PC at the radio end. Well, in my case, um, it was to originally run um, Ham Radio Deluxe. But as it turned out, I found out I could do things like control. Uh, I could do debugging on my net, on my network in the Flex Radio world. I can update my software on the radio uh, today, and I'm going to show you in a coming slide uh, how I run all my digital programs, FT8, WSJT, uh, N1MM, even on the PC at the remote network. And I just use I happen to use either any desk or VNC, believe it or not, to connect to the remote device. And it's just like being there. Uh, it allowed me in the early days when there was no remote software to have all my little application programs on this PC. Software for the KPA 500, software for the stepper. Um, I had temperature gauges, et cetera, et cetera. And you know what? You only then have to maintain one PC to operate. I've had friends use my station for contesting, and it's great. They just connect to this PC. And everything's configured like they came and sat down at your ham shack. And it also means you can sit down at your ham shack from anywhere. You grab another computer, uh, you know, even a Chromebook for that matter, and you can connect to your PC because it calls home technology type of thing. And it just, it's not a bad way to go. In fact, it's really darn good. And uh, as I said earlier, P running PCs remotely is not a problem. Uh, in, you know, what, since 2005, I think I've had one failure where the PC didn't boot correctly. I fixed it. It's the type of thing you have to test. Um, every four or five years, I change the PC out. Um, I run Windows 10 Pro. I don't have any antivirus on it. And it's, uh, if you power cycle, it comes right back up and works. Incredibly, incredibly reliable. Bite the bullet, do it. You won't regret it. And even right now, um, this is uh, from today when I... You know, I was running all this FT8 stuff on six meters, and again, having it at the local PC it means I'm getting the audio right from the radio and in the flex world, right in the digital domain, uh, and I'm not sending it over the internet. If you try to send that into the over the internet, because of the technology that's used, you will lose uh, data packets or information, resulting in lost audio packets and uh, bad decoding. So this gives me a much better performance. Uh, even programs, um, you know, other digital programs like RTTY or whatever will benefit from this sort of operation. So antenna control. Uh, there's a, most antenna switches have three or four wires. You know what? You can change those with some relays to make it easy. Microbit has a beautiful antenna switch that you can control by web. I think, I thought Green Heron did, but I couldn't find it. Uh, 403A 
which is all designed to work with Flex Radio and OEM radios, Icon, Kenwood, Elecraft, Yesu, uh, to automatically antenna switch. This will make your life a lot easier uh, type of thing. We remote rig, that's micro bit with their antenna switch. Uh, you can use PST rotator. There's ways to configure it to control relays, to turn on power to certain relays, and you know you get the idea. That works really well. Um, you can have radios send band data to antenna switches and a whole ton of do-it-yourself solutions. And again, you don't have to come up with this on your own. Um, if you share with others what stuff you have lying around, maybe we can come up with some ideas that will work for you. So what do you do with power failures? Well, I run one UPS, the PC's on it. What else is on it? Because um, I use a bunch of Raspberry Pis, they're all on it, or they're five volt power supplies. And um, two things I've learned with UPSs. Some of them don't like the cold. When it gets really cold, they just shut off. And uh, you want to make sure that they all start up in operate mode in case you have a long outage of hours or days so that everything comes right back up. It's the type of bench testing you really need to do. Uh, and you have to try them all. So as you go to get started, you want to make sure that you define your goals. Start easy. Radio, multiple, one antenna, maybe two antennas. Test things on your bench one at a time. Don't just set it up, and I hear this from our customers all the time. I turned on remote, I set up SmartLink, I got in the car, I got in an airplane, and I'm in Timbuktu, and I can't connect to my radio because they never tested it before they left. You need to do that. If you build this out as a good solid foundation, just of, of radio and, and turning a few things on and off and the ability to reset, focus on that part, the rest gets easier, becomes more and more reliable. Make sure you keep lots of notes. Do some sketches of your layouts, of your power layouts, your IP addresses, if you're hard coding IP addresses, um, your passwords, another whole hour discussion we could just do on networking. And you need to plan this and think it out um, I give Flex full credit long before I started uh, representing them and working for them with Flex Radio. You can see that it was designed from the ground up to do remote thing because everything is done over the Ethernet. And I asked Steve Hicks that one day back in Dayton about 2012 or 2013 when I saw the new Flex 6000 series and had the radio in my hand and there was an Ethernet connector on the back. I said, hey, Steve, what can I do with the connector on the back of this? And he goes, everything. And you know what? They were right. You do not have to have any network experience to set up SmartLink on their world. It automatically calls home. Don't need a VPN. You don't need static IP addresses. And if you go over to the Flex booth, they'll be happy to explain it to you. And there's demos. As you get into ICOM and remote rig, et cetera, uh, they are requiring a little bit more network expertise. You may have to learn about Dyn DNS, uh, VPNs, port forwards. Uh, all doable, and all a lot of it's all on Google. You know, it's easy to learn, but you do need to want to learn a little bit. I've been working in this document here again. Something else you can scan or link on, sort of the basics of setting up a station. Uh, you can go pull that down. Uh, it's a living document, so as I find cool things to put in it, I'll just add it, and you can just go refresh it. Uh, and so, uh, and then I can't go. I have to mention Node Red. And that's an advanced thing. Now, Node-RED, uh, and in my case, it runs in a Raspberry Pi. It's an IBM control software designed for machine-to-machine -machine communication. But it really allowed us to say, uh, hey, can you listen to the radio, find out what band I'm on, and when I change bands, can you tell my antenna switch? And it allowed people who are not programmers like me, I am not a programmer, I'm an integrator, to make this all work and write my own stuff. And you can actually do this. And you can, and it's all web-based, and if you, you can have a browser, if you can get to the GUI on your browser from anything, you can turn things on and off. On the right-hand side, uh, I know it's a little eye charty to read, but that is a uh, control panel for my HF station. I can read that on a PC, I can read it on my iPhone, my iPad, whatever. It works really well. And our, we have a group, I have a link at the end on how to get to the group. We are all about collaborating and teaching and learning and sharing solutions. There are a lot of solutions already in place that allow you to get going. Um, here's some links that are for some, that I, I referenced. I'm sure there's more. Uh, I'm happy to add them to my getting started document or to, even to this presentation. 
Uh, Facebook, there's a remote HF uh, station building group. Uh, it's got about 500 members on it. It's a little quiet at times, but ask questions there. We're happy to answer. Uh, on the Flex Radio World, there's a whole community on remote operation. There's a whole remote rig forum, and there's that link. There's an ICOM RS BA1. I think that was the forum for it. Didn't look incredibly active. Uh, the Rig Pi forum uh, on groups.io, the No Red users group on groups.io, and I'm sure there's more. And uh, so, what about me? I got started in ham radio back in 1974, and I'm still playing in ham radio, and I'm still learning new things, and I'm probably still blowing the odd thing up. But uh, as I was told by a couple of Elmers, you know, don't ever stop learning, you die, and don't get stuck in one part of ham radio. There's just so much of it. Heck, you know, you're here at Dayton, so I, I'm, I'm sure that's not true, that you're doing a lot of things. I've got four videos you can go watch later on different parts of my remote station and how I did it. It's how I did it. Hopefully it gives you some ideas on how you want to do it. Uh, I started down this path in 2005. It's been a hell of a journey. And uh, I, get, um, I get so much enjoyment out of it when it works. I love putting it all together and, um, you know, and tinkering. And I've learned by a lot of failures. And, uh, and as, as we all do, right? Failing is a learning experience. And if you want a copy of this presentation, you can go scan this code and download it. It'll come down as a PDF document. And, uh, you know, there you go. So I wanted to take it. Thanks for listening. Uh, hopefully I'm here part uh, with you in this presentation and we can have some questions. Uh, if not, uh, my uh, cohorts came over to back me up here and maybe next year we'll have a chance to get there. 73, thanks for taking the time to come to Dayton 2022, and I apologize immensely that I wasn't able to make it down there, but one of those life things happens and I had to do the right thing. 73. Okay, well, we're waiting for that. How many of you have a handy talkie on two meters? Have you ever used a repeater? Then you are a remote ham radio operator. It's just you didn't build the darn thing. Especially if you can control things like back in the 70s and 80s, we had these things called auto patches, right? We're almost ready to go live. Yes, I can, perfectly. Do you have any questions? Uh, because of this noisy air conditioning unit, you're going to have to stand up and shout your question loudly, and we'll try to relay it so everybody else can hear it, and Mike too, and then we'll wait for his answer. So who's got a question? Right down there. Oh, put up the QR code. We'll see if I can. Yes, I did, and in fact, I've even posted it to the entire presentation on my YouTube channel. I just finished. So uh, if you search, you can find it and watch it again when you go. Two hundred and forty volt switch for an amplifier. So I posted a couple of solutions in that document uh, regarding it. It's easier in Europe because of the common voltage. It's a little bit more challenging in North America, but not impossible. Um, if I take my hat off and say unofficially, if you're so inclined, you could build your own, but you need to check your insurance and everything. Um, relays are pretty common to do that. That's what I personally did, although I can't necessarily say you should. but. There is a couple of off-the-shelf ones, and uh, in that getting started document I posted, uh, I believe I have a link for one of the ones that somebody else found on uh, Amazon that should help you out. Um, they tend to be control switches that are also used for cool heating systems or hot water tanks. HVAC contactors and things like that. Next. But any... any um, you know, if, if you've been around long enough and played with this stuff, any potter or chrome seal 
relay will be more than adequate running on 12 volt type of thing. Any other questions? We, either you're all asleep or Mike did such an amazing job that there are no questions left to ask. Oh, one day. Okay, we do about digital, but what about CW? No. Okay. That's a good question. Um, this will be a bit of a long answer. In the flex world with the Maestro, it's a plug and play solution. However, uh, that's a little harder in every other world, um, especially at a high level. Um, WinKeyer makes a keyer that you can plug in, and it actually decodes your CW and then we'll send the characters to the other end. Uh, I'll have to write that up. And Dan, I was actually thinking of writing up a document, you know, that would be, um, uh, that would replace the, not replace the maestro, but in parallel to the maestro to allow you to do remote push to talk, which is a challenge, and remote CW. Um, but the, the wing keyers with built-in serial ports will decode what you're sending, like the letter A, grab the character A, and then send it to the wing keyer at the other end and the A will be sent. It works fairly well. It runs about a character behind. Uh, what you do lose is the ability to uh, maybe a bit more of the signature in your fifth. And um, I'm going to ask Dan a question here in the flex world because I've forgotten the answer. So I think, Dan, don't we actually we capture the make and break time and send the the element in terms of how long the dash was in milliseconds? But Fast. at the other end. Yeah, so you could explain that in the flex world a little different, which then allows you to capture the characteristics of your test a bit more. So if you want to elaborate on that a bit more. And the, it, hear yourself when you're you're sending, and then uh, the, the timing of the responses, especially in contest contesting. So if there's you know half a second delay and stuff, that would drive the people that are running at 35 words a minute absolutely bonkers. So it's a lot harder. Um, but um, you know, hear yourself sending is number one. Uh, number two is you know the gap between when you hear the other come, person come back and when you send it. Right. So it's, there's, it, one more thing, there's one more thing I wanted to add. If, the, if you're really trying to do remote CW, then I would highly recommend using the remote rig solution. It's just really good at it. Yeah, remote rig's pretty good. The other thing to point out is that there's physics involved here too, right? Correct. So yeah. if, if, you're, if, you're, if, you, if your ping time, for example, between where you are and the remote radio is 130 milliseconds, right? Uh, round trip is going to be 260 milliseconds, and there is just not a lot you can do with that. You know, so that's sort of where you start. It's a challenge, but it, you know what? It's a challenge, but it, at least you'll be able to hear people. So uh, you, you, you yeah. may have to adjust your operating style but the trade-off is worth it, I think. So you're saying that you could use any desk to hear yourself on from the, that's generated at the on the road. Yeah, that's that's certainly a way you could do it. There's still a bit of a delay there. So personally, I prefer yeah, that, the side tone right when I'm keying it in, mm. and then I really don't care about hearing the transmit side. What I do care about is the timing between things. Yeah, yeah and, and to elaborate on what that person asked, in the flex world, we have a, um, you know, a fall on our sort. We have something that needs to be resolved when sending remote Morse code, say, from N1MF, if you don't hear the ride down. Uh, Dan can elaborate that later, maybe, on, on why that physically, physically worked that way. It's something we will, been told we'll, we will address. And um, it, uh, 
And, but it's also correct. You really want to hear the side tone local to you. So again, more physics and delays because you're in two different worlds at the same time, to be honest. So. Next question. Side, the sideband is, is a wonderful mode to do remotely, right? Because, um, you know, it, it, unless, unless you want to hear what you sound like on the air, right? If you're, if you're okay with hearing yourself, you know, through um, like an amplified system, you know, locally, then it's not a problem. You know, but what gets difficult is that if you want to hear the actual signal re-received and then sent back to you. And then, it, you know, some people can do that all day long without a problem. For me, it's like Control-Alt-Delete. You know, I just, I, it, it just reboots me. I can't, I can't talk. Mike, did you have anything else to add there? No. Again, when you do remote operating, whether it's digital, CW, or sideband, you're going to have to adjust uh, and deal with latency. Um, it's a different world. Uh, I, I guess I'm pretty numb to it now, but I've been at it since 2005. Uh, I learned a lot about it. and um, it's, But the tools to be able to hear things much better to get to a quieter location, in my case, far away, you know, millisecond response time. And even in contesting, and if you've been in a big contest and you've been on the receiving end of a pileup, the guy who's copying you doesn't come back to the first person that calls him. He calls, he calls the first complete call sign he hears. It's much faster to work. He, he goes, hey, VA 3 mw or 5 times, rather than who was the Victor Alpha what? You know, and 19 people call him back. He's not going to do that until he's looking for people to make contact with. So. Timing is actually everything, so latency isn't always a deep. That's a great point. Yes, sir. So that was that's actually really good. So he was taught, he was basically making the point that using some of like the the, um, the web SDRs that are out there uh, positioned all over the world, so you can sort of hear what you sound like, you know. Right. Good idea. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Does Flex Radio have any plans to coordinate? So the question is, Flex have any plans to uh, provide a mechanism to share your radio to a broader pool of uh, AMs through Flex Radio? I can grab through that Through Flex one. Radio. You can grab that one, yeah. Okay. Come so the, the, the short answer is no. Um, you know, the, our, our radios certainly facilitate that kind of operation. Um, I know that there are feature requests that we get about allowing more than one person to log into our SmartLink server so that they can share radios that way. That's something that's on our feature list, and we don't talk about when that is, but we do acknowledge that it is a feature that has been requested. To do that today, my best recommendation is to go with Remote Ham Radio or one of the other ones. Those guys do a really phenomenal job, and they're not that expensive. Like when you're, you know, for their basic stuff, it is it is pretty, you know, uh, you know, easy on your wallet. And they truly have some outstanding um, um, sites, you know. And and they're and they're on the community. And go to our go to our um, our booth, and there's a bunch of the the youth from. Um, uh, remote ham radio, and that's probably one of the more exciting things for me is to see 
uh, that these kids now have the opportunity to get active without having, because a lot of these kids live in HOA, um, you know, areas, and they just can't put up antennas like I could when I was a kid, right? So, um, you know, that, that it's really exciting to see that. But that was a great question. Thank you. Okay, so the question was about how does this fit in with the FCC's for not to do business over um, over the radio? Well, um, I, I would let Lee answer. Go ahead. That. Go ahead, Mike. You want me to do that or you? Yeah. So I, I, we've talked about that with them, and they're not doing business over the radio. They're providing a service, and there's a difference. The law, at least as I understand them in Canada, which are parallel to the FCC, uh, is that you can't buy a ham radio. This is why they're in place. You can't buy a ham radio and then run your tax business about two meters. That's the business part that that law addresses. It, to provide a service to use a station, uh, yeah, I don't think you could capture the same, same thing. That's my guess. I'm not a lawyer. Um, we could probably ask Anna, but uh, I know also that uh, if RHR uh, or Be Loud or the other companies that have done that, uh, I, 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 well, I guarantee that they have their own lawyer. They investigated it. Otherwise, the risk is too high to do it and then be shut down. If, if, if they took your credit card over the radio, that would be due to uh, over the radio. Right? I know. It's the same as trying to order a pizza over the repeater. You that can't order a, well, you can't order a pizza over the radio either, right? Yes. You can't order a pizza? Yes. <laughs> well, see, I've been missing out, right? Yeah. <laughs> Right. But that's great. And that's a bit beyond the scope of today's discussion, so we'll move on. Any more questions? We got three minutes left. You're not going to, you know, you got uh, Mike, you know, let me tell you a little something about Mike, just from personal. I've been a ham radio operator since 1971, and um, I've been active like, almost the entire time. And I always thought, I always put myself in the category of being like the ham radio, ham radio operator, right? Like the ham's ham. There, I, I'm not even close when I compare myself to Michael. Um, honestly, Michael, is all over the place. If you're familiar with Ham Radio Workbench, he's a regular uh, on that podcast. He's a regular on other podcasts. Uh, and he always has something on his bench. And I've learned a ton by talking with him. So you got two minutes here. This guy, hey, I made it to this guy has forgotten me. more than I have ever learned about uh, <laughs> hooking stuff up on the radio station. What was that? Oh, all right. So we got someone here that would like to provide feedback on the Yesu uh, uh, interface. Oh, please. It's yeah, actually love before our queue. What's your name, sir? Robert. 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 Uh, that, that hardware interface is great for remotely controlling the radio if that's all you want to do. If you want to run FT8 or any other digital mode with that, uh, don't buy the S SC LAN 10. Uh, just connect it to your uh, computer and, and connect to your computer remotely with any of the remote control things. I use uh, remote desktop from Google and it works awesome. The, um, the hardware interface is only if you want um, absolute control over the radio, but you can't run any digital mode with it. So there's some serious trade-offs there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Did you hear that, Mike? No, I didn't, but you can give me a call later. Said, and basically, you said if you want to want to switch uh, frequencies and modes and operate the radio um, as uh, just, just using 
switching modes and all that, it's great. But if you try to do any uh, digital modes on it, it's just not, you, know, you just can't do it. I've never had one more back in the back of the room. Well, that was a commercial for Flex Radio. Uh, and um, <laughs> um, <laughs> you can stop by the booth to, booth to get your payment um, later. Yes, okay. Make sure you get the hat. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, we're, we're, thank you so very much. You have a wonderful show. And nice to see you all. Well done. Yep, thank you.